I'm Nicole Burley. It is Monday, August 30th. This is rush hour. The remnants of what was once Hurricane Ida inching farther north through the southeast tonight. A day after the storm battered parts of Louisiana with triple digit winds and inundated coastal towns with flash floods. That storm made landfall around midday Sunday, one of the strongest hurricanes to ever hit the U.S. mainland. A category four hurricane with wind speeds topping out at 150 miles per hour. Some parts of Louisiana saw more than a foot of rain. New Orleans drenched by nearly 14 inches. With the storm pushing past Louisiana and into Mississippi, today the focus shifting to rescue operations along the coast. Hundreds of first responders in boats, helicopters, helicopters, amphibious vehicles maneuvering through flooded streets and downed power lines to find anyone trapped by that rising water. Others out assessing the damage tonight, particularly devastating in and around New Orleans. You can see awnings ripped from buildings, downed trees that came crashing down on cars, and power lines littering residential streets. But city officials say despite the damage, they saw no immediate signs of catastrophic flooding like after Hurricane Katrina more than a decade ago. But countless people lost their homes or businesses, and widespread power outages across the area are only hampering those recovery efforts. Some people preparing for the possibility of waiting weeks before power is restored. So here's the latest on this storm right now. Ida so far being blamed for at least two deaths, someone killed by a falling tree outside Baton Rouge, and a motorist who drowned in New Orleans. But Louisiana Governor John Bell Edwards says he expects that number to climb over the coming days. Meanwhile, more than one one million people still without power across Louisiana and Mississippi. In Louisiana, four hospitals reported hurricane damage, while nearly 40 medical centers in the state are running on generator power. And at least 2,000 people evacuated to area shelters, which is another number expected to climb. News Nation correspondent Marky Martin live tonight in New Orleans. And Marky, you wrote up the brunt of Ida last night. So what's it like there on the ground right now? Yeah, hey, Nicole, very bizarre that after a night like that, you can have a day that has beautiful weather like this. I'm standing in front of the most severe damage that we have found thus far in New Orleans. This building or the remnants of what was this building right behind me here. This was an old famous record shop. This was a jazz record shop that Louis Armstrong is said to have worked at for a time and he would frequent when he came back into town. This was his second home. It's gone in one night in one fell swoop just like that. And Nicole, that's not even the worst of what we've seen. What you're looking at right here is actually my neighbor's car porch. This is Monday morning in Louisiana. It's back to work, this time rebuilding what Ida tore apart. It, it hurts. It hurts. This is unbelievable, something I've never seen before. For those who live here, there's no time to process what they just lived through. Oh, it's just how when it's like a horror story. I have my three grandchildren with me. My old, the oldest one is six. I was scared for their lives. From homes and hotels in Homa. The owner started putting people in rooms so where the roof wouldn't cave in on them. To the bayous up by New Orleans, Ida's destruction is widespread. I was really scared. Especially when you don't know where your family is. It's like, it's horrific. But hurricanes will have to try harder because for Louisianans, their resiliency lies in the starting over. Their roots here, much deeper than those any storm can peel away. We don't need to worry about the material things or anything like that. We have life, we have the energy, we have the ability. So we'll rebuild, put it back together again. The situation really has yeah, their mentality just unparalleled here, Nicole. And of course, you know, Louisianans endured a really long night with Ida making landfall uh, as a category four. Those winds packed a punch. You could feel it last night. It was unlike anything that I've ever felt. But you know, a, a lot of it couldn't really see or. All right, looks like we're having some technical difficulties. We will check back in with Marky later on this hour. Well, the other big story tonight, of course, America's longest war is now over. Over the course of 20 years, more than 2,400 Americans lost their lives in Afghanistan. And this afternoon, the final U.S. planes left the country. News Nation Washington, D.C. correspondent Allison Harris joining us now. So, Allison, the war is over, but the unrest continues. 
It does, Nicole, and up until the very end, the threat for U.S. troops on the ground at the airport in Kabul remained high. The drawdown of U.S. troops is now complete, but the effort to rescue Americans who are still in Afghanistan is underway. It is ongoing, even without U.S. troops on the ground. America's longest war is over. The last C-17 lifted off from Hamad Karzai International Airport on August 30th this afternoon at 3.29 p.m. General McKinsey making the announcement that for the first time in 20 years, U.S. troops are out of Afghanistan, but an estimated 250 Americans who want to get out remain unable to make the last few flights out. We were not able to bring any Americans out. That activity ended probably about 12 hours before our exit, although we continued the outreach and would have been prepared to, to bring them on until the very last minute, but none of them made it to the airport and were able to be and were able to be accommodated. The State Department still vowing those Americans won't be left behind. The withdrawal of troops became the largest airlift ever, led by the U.S. Frantic, chaotic, and botched, according to critics of the president. The White House says more than 120,000 lives were saved, rescuing Afghans who helped the U.S. and roughly 6,000 U.S. citizens. But thousands of Afghan allies are left behind. The U.S. and more than 100 countries now coming together in an agreement to pressure the Taliban to allow safe passage out of the country for any Americans or Afghan allies who remain there. We have an enormous amount of leverage, including access to the global marketplace, which is not a small piece of leverage. On the ground in an Afghan TV interview, Taliban militants stand armed, calling on Afghans not to flee. Up to the last minute of the evacuation effort, the Pentagon warning of real threats after the president received the bodies of 11 of the 13 military members, all age 31 and under, killed in a suicide bombing outside the airport by ISIS-K, bringing the U.S. service member death toll to 2,461. The U.S. launched airstrikes targeting ISIS-K Sunday, and there are now questions whether this burning car was used to fire five rockets at U.S. troops at the airport. U.S. forces intercepted one rocket. Another made it through U.S. defenses, but did no damage and caused no casualties. Right now, there is no plan for even a diplomatic presence to remain in Afghanistan. The, the president has made it clear that our, our combat mission, our, the, the war we have been fighting in Afghanistan, that, that's going to end. And it's going to end very soon here. But what's not going to end is our commitment, especially here at the Defense Department, to protect the American people uh, from, from threats, and particularly from any terrorist threat that could emanate from Afghanistan. The Taliban is now expected to take full control of the country. A Taliban spokesperson tweeting, our country has gained full independence. And some breaking news, the White House just released a statement in which President Biden says he will make uh, remarks to the American people tomorrow about his decision to not extend the deadline beyond August 31st, saying that that decision was unanimous with the Joint Chiefs and commanders on the ground in Afghanistan, saying it was the best way to protect the security of U.S. troops who were in Afghanistan and also protect the future prospect of some of those Americans and Afghan allies getting safe passage out of the country. Nicole? Yeah, we certainly look forward to those comments from the president. All right, Allison, thank you. Well, back to our hurricane coverage now. This is another live look at the Big Easy tonight. One day after the storm lashed the Louisiana coast, the city of New Orleans and surrounding areas still largely without power. News Nation's Jack Royer from our station WIAT is in New Orleans with a look at how the storm impacted the city. As the sun came up on a battered New Orleans, Ida's destruction became clear. So did the reality for people feeling trapped in the Big Easy with no power and no plan. These girls are in town on a bachelorette trip, trying to get home to Philadelphia. We've now booked five different flights. Everything's booked. Near the French Quarter, Darnetta Austin came to New Orleans for her birthday, only to have Ida crash the party. I had a very bad birthday. No lights, no water in the hotel, nothing. It just, just all chaos, just broke, like, just broke loose. Though. The powerful storm walloped the French Quarter, ripping roofs off buildings and flooding some streets. Widespread power outages now forcing the city to tell people who evacuated, don't come back yet. The city relying on the levee system to keep water out. 
facing its first true test since Hurricane Katrina, but they need power for the pumps to get rid of storm water inside, and fearing power restoration could take weeks. Do you have a place to stay tonight? Uh, we're not sure about that. Not, not sure too yet. sure. Nope. A long road ahead to get the Big Easy back to normal. Reporting in New Orleans, I'm Jack Royer. Yeah, certainly a long road there. Let's turn out to Chief Meteorologist Albert Ramon. He is down in our weather center. Albert, I know you've been following this from the very beginning. Tell us where is Ida right now and what's the situation on the ground? So the center of Ida located just north of Jackson, Mississippi. The main concern over the next couple of days is going to be the threat from flash flooding. So here's a look at the wide perspective satellite radar. It is now a tropical depression with sustained winds of 35 miles per hour, lifting up towards the north northeast at nine miles per hour. Now, still on the northeast sector of this low, we're still seeing moderate showers. We're still seeing those wind gusts exceeding 30, if not 40 miles per hour, not far from Columbus, Mississippi, in the northeastern section of the state. And that even extends back off towards the west into Alabama. But it's been southern Mississippi and southern Alabama where we've had the roughest weather so far today with these rain bands relentless still coming off the Gulf of Mexico, still producing flash flooding and at times quick spin up tornadoes. The tornado watch, though, that was in effect earlier this afternoon has been dropped, at least for now. Doppler radar estimates. This is just off towards the west of Mobile, Alabama, over 10 inches of rainfall. But overall, the heaviest rainfall that we've seen from this once category four hurricane was in southeast Louisiana. Doppler radar estimates of rainfall amounts of 12 to 13 inches off towards the west and up towards the northwest of New Orleans, western sections of Lake Pontchartrain, northwestern sections of the lake. So by tomorrow, the center of Ida will be over Middle Tennessee. And by the time we head into Wednesday and Thursday, we're looking at shower potential moving in to the northeast. And some of this could be heavy. We're talking about a wide swath from Mississippi stretching all the way into places like central Pennsylvania of seeing three to five inches of rainfall with isolated locations seeing maybe as much as six inches. So. Yes, the heaviest rainfall on the coast at landfall, but still the flash flood threat will be with us for the better half of the week from where it is now north of Jackson, Mississippi, and through the end of the week in south central areas of Pennsylvania. Even rain, although not as heavy, expected in New York City. We'll keep an eye on this. Have another update for you coming up in a few minutes, Nicole. Yeah, that's a powerful system. Wow. All right, still to come tonight on Rush Hour as the remnants of Hurricane Ida push farther north. How Americans from coast to coast are lending a helping hand to the Gulf Coast communities impacted by the storm. We'll take you live to where Ida is hitting right now. The hard-hitting storm conditions are causing damage across southern states, including Mississippi. Ida crossed into the state last night, bringing strong winds and heavy rain. We have some video. This was taken along the Gulf Coast. News Nation's Anna Farish from our station WJTV is live tonight in Jackson, Mississippi. So, Anna, describe what it's like there right now. Behind me, this is some of the worst damage that we're seeing in Hines County. I'm right in North Jackson. The rain is still coming down. I'm going to pan the camera this way so you can see. You can definitely tell that this tree, part of it has split off and hit this car right here and into the front of this home as well. Now, I do want to zoom in a little bit closer so you can get a better picture as to what we are seeing. But um, this is some of the worst damage that we are seeing in Hines County. Now, I was able to speak to a man who um, just came by to grab a few things out of the home, went in there pretty carefully. And he said that the person that was inside this home was doing all right. Uh, she was not inside the home at the time. I was able to confirm that with the Hines County EMA director. But four other reports of damages here in Hines County, all with trees on homes. But thankfully, no one was injured in any of those situations. We are thankful that things aren't much worse here in Mississippi. But however, uh, we could see some possible trees down, a little bit more power lines coming down. There have been some of those across the state as well, just because of how saturated this ground could get. A lot of those trees could get uprooted, a lot of those power lines falling down. So everybody just still needs to remember that we're not out of the clear just yet here in Mississippi. But again, we're thankful things aren't worse. Nicole, back to you. Great reporting, Anna. Even operating the camera, it looks like yourself. We appreciate that. And please stay safe. <laughs> 
The storm expected to continue making its way northeast, scattering high winds and rain across the eastern U.S. One city in the path, in its path, Tupelo, Mississippi, which is where News Nation's Janelle Fort is live for us tonight. So, Janelle, explain what the situation is like there. Well, Nicole, the storm hasn't quite made its way to us yet. Where we are is um, a few miles northeast of where Annie was in Haynes County. So we're kind of next on the path of this storm. Again, we're in Tupelo, Mississippi, uh, northeast part of the state. For reference, uh, this is the birthplace of Elvis Presley. One thing I've noticed here, not many storm preps done by the people here. Right now, Tupelo is under a flash flood watch as well as a wind advisory. Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, all getting hit with some pretty heavy rain from Ida uh, as it tracks its way inland here in Mississippi since landfall. Uh, Ida, as Annie said, has barreled through the state, toppling trees, uh, knocking off power lines and just really causing havoc as it continues its shift inwards uh, to our east in Alabama. We've seen those tornadoes happening. And then as it makes its way here to Tupelo, in the overnight hours, we're expecting a lot of rain. We're expecting uh, the possibility of some flash, warning, some flash flooding again. And then from there, the storm is expected to cross over into the Tennessee Valley. And if you remember, just two weeks ago, that area hit hard by historic flooding, 20 people dead, widespread damage. That area is in the process of cleaning up, of rebuilding, and now they're having to take a pause to that as they brace for this storm. And then it'll clear out there. It'll move its way uh, into the Ohio Valley and then further to our northeast. But still, Nicole, there is a lot to watch out for as Ida continues its path. Back to you. Oh, yeah, Ida is very strong. All right, Janelle, thank you. Well, tonight, Alabama is being hit by the outer bands of Ida. The state's beaches closed today due to the high surf. That storm dropping several inches of rain, causing some flooded streets. News Nation's Debbie Williams from our mobile station, WKRG, is live for us tonight in Gulf Shores. Debbie, we can see the beach behind you there. How are conditions right now? Well, we're at low tide, believe it or not. Let me step out of the way and let you take a look at that surf in the Gulf of Mexico. Those waves are breaking right now at about five to six feet, which is an improvement over the 12 footers that we saw yesterday because of Hurricane Ida. Water has been the issue with this storm. Several area roads remain closed more than 24 hours after Ida made landfall. Crews have begun trying to begin the cleanup. The main public beach remains closed. They hope to have that back open by Wednesday, but we're still dealing with a lot of watches and warnings. Coastal and flash flooding, still a real threat. You can see out there maybe in the distance, more rain bands that are headed our way. Double red flags are flying along Alabama beaches, meaning those waters are closed. And if you go out in those waters, you could go to jail for taking a swim in that. Reporting live in Gulf Shores, Alabama, I'm Debbie Williams. Back to you. Yeah, Debbie, seeing those waves behind you, we can certainly understand why the beaches are closed. All right, thank you for that. Please stay safe. Still ahead tonight on Rush Hour, we are monitoring the latest developments from Ida, now downgraded to a tropical depression, but still very strong. A closer look at the damage on the ground as that system moves north. And a wildfire emergency forcing evacuations in a popular California resort town. News Nation Live from South Lake Tahoe coming up. Welcome back to Rush Hour. Here's what's happening in your nation right now. What was once Hurricane Ida, now downgraded to a tropical depression just a day after battering the Gulf Coast with triple-digit winds and heavy rain. That dangerous storm was one of the strongest to ever hit the U.S. mainland. A Category 4 hurricane with winds that reached 150 miles per hour, destroying homes, uprooting trees, and downing power lines across the region. So here's the latest info. At least two confirmed deaths linked to Ida, someone killed by a falling tree outside Baton Rouge, and a driver who drowned in New Orleans. Meanwhile, more than a million people still without power tonight across Louisiana and Mississippi. The Louisiana National Guard has deployed nearly 5,000 personnel to aid in rescue and recovery efforts. The local energy provider says more than 2,000 miles of power lines are out of service, and it could be weeks until that power is restored. So let's get to News Nation. Chief Meteorologist Albert Ramon, he's live in our weather center. Albert, where is Ida right now?
to Mississippi and the thing at Cole Ida is not the only thing that we're going to have to keep an eye on in the coming days. I want to show you the big perspective. We also have Kate, a new tropical storm in the Atlantic, and then a tropical wave coming off of Africa that has a 90% chance of becoming our next named storm. Both systems will watch, but not an immediate threat to the United States. And look at this and the Caribbean Sea. That could develop in the coming days. Right now, only a 20% chance of development. Now, to the latest radar and satellite picture, here it is. This is Ida, a tropical depression, 35 mile per hour winds. Right there, that's Jackson, Mississippi, and this is moving up towards the north northeast. It'll be a big rainmaker, again, three to five, maybe isolated six inches of rainfall from Mississippi spreading all the way into Pennsylvania. Let's back up the radar to a little over 24 hours ago. This is when Ida made landfall as a cat for 150 mile per hour. Sustained winds made landfall at 11.55 a.m. yesterday on Sunday here at Port Fouchon. Look at the wind gust when it made landfall. 172 mile per hour wind gust. New Orleans clocking in a 90 mile per hour wind gust. The wind starting to settle down along the coast. The rain, though, continues, especially for the panhandle of Florida. We'll keep an eye on that throughout the evening, Nicole. All right, Albert, thank you. Well, many in Louisiana getting their first look at the storm damage today after Hurricane Ida brought winds at speeds nearly 150 miles per hour. You can see that water level there just so high. News Nation's Bill Wood from our New Orleans station, WGNO, spoke to residents about what's left behind. Andy Wilson wakes up to a front yard full of water. Four blocks from Lake Pontchartrain, Hurricane Ida pushed the Louisiana lake up to the old Mandeville house. This is the worst I've seen so far in terms of flooding. Um, Katrina, where I, I was, in, uh, I was in Jefferson Parish at the time, and that, we had nothing like this. Across St. Tammany Parish, it's the day after a night to never forget. I slept in a bedtub. You slept in the bathtub? I stayed in the, in the tub, me and my kids in the tub. <laughs> the hurricane left a trail of trouble from flooding to ripping off the front of Party City and turning upside down the boat somebody decided to name Wind and Wine. The entrance on the other side. Carter Geis goes for a walk every morning. His neighborhood never looked like this without electricity leaving everybody in the dark. It was frightening. It really was because you know we live over here, you know, partially because of the trees and they become your biggest enemy. The wind that made it to 111 mile an hour gusts sent trees and power poles into streets and blew the roof off the art house art gallery. I'm used to hurricanes, but this was, uh, this was interesting. That very same wind flies the flag that stands for the spirit of the people navigating another storm. In St. Tammany Parish, Louisiana, Bill Wood, back to you. All right, Bill, thank you for that. Well, President Biden met with federal and local emergency officials in Washington today about the federal response to Hurricane Ida. The president also relaying exactly what's been done so far along the Gulf Coast. News Nation correspondent Joe Khalil joining us now live from Washington. So, Joe, what can people in the affected areas expect? Well, they're going to get a lot of updates day by day. Today, the president uh, had a virtual meeting with uh, FEMA, along with, as you said, governors from states that have been affected and local officials. They're basically giving them an update as to what the federal government is doing to try to help these states. Now, we know people can expect uh, the Biden administration has already approved that emergency disaster declaration. What that means is these states now have a lot of access to federal dollars they wouldn't normally get. And uh, the process is also going to be streamlined. These states can cut through a lot of the red tape that normally would be in their way to get resources directly to people who need them. So that's what we saw today. President Biden also said that we're really just beginning to see the consequences of this storm. We know Hurricane Ida had the potential to cause massive, massive damage, uh, damage and, uh, and that's exactly what we saw. We already know there's been at least one confirmed death. And uh, a number uh, that number is likely to grow. Um, and I've got Again, the administration regularly updating the public about what FEMA is doing, hoping perhaps not to have a repeat of a lot of the blowback they got uh, FEMA during Katrina. So here's what we know so far about FEMA and what they've done on the ground. Uh, 3,600 employees they've deployed to six different states that have been affected. Uh, they have provided more than 3.4 million meals, a lot of water to people who need it, and 200 generators. Now, that last bit's really important because we know there are at least four hospitals and dozens of medical centers that didn't have power. They are running right now, getting patients 
uh, using those generators. One last bit, uh, because of that emergency declaration, people are eventually, when the storm to apply for some federal assistance. That is gonna be a Herculean effort to assess that and disperse all that money. That is also gonna fall on FEMA eventually. Nicole? All right, Joe, yeah, with no power, those generators desperately needed. All right, thank yeah. you for that. Well, crews from around the nation are on the road tonight, heading to the Gulf region to help in any way possible. Governors across the South have activated the National Guard. And News Nation's Aaron Nolan joining us live tonight from Arkansas. Aaron, that is one of the states sending help. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Nicole. The numbers you were just talking about continue to grow. Just hours ago, the National Guard here in Arkansas increased from 20 to more than 500 being deployed to the Gulf Coast. Across the country, help is heading to the Gulf. Power companies from New Jersey and Connecticut, search and rescue from Ohio and Colorado, back to the National Guard. Joining Arkansas, Tennessee is preparing to go as well. Louisiana, Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, they're already there. In Louisiana, the Guard had 195 high water vehicles and 73 rescue boats, and they are ready. Now, let's go from the federal level back here to the city and county level across the U.S. A group of task force starting in Florida with Miami Dade County, they are also being deployed from their locations to the Gulf Coast. In Miami Dade, you're talking more than three dozen. Now, here in Fayetteville, Arkansas, a group of firefighters also going. And that's not totally uncommon to see neighbors helping neighbors. And what they're going to see at the Gulf Coast is also not common. Oh, it's a war zone. Um, all of the infrastructure will be gone. There won't be any cell phone service. There won't be any water, no electricity. Uh, it's, it's a war zone. Nicole, I've also talked to a civilian nonprofit group that is based here in Arkansas. They're on the national level. They have been to many other natural disasters all across the country. They are also preparing to go on Wednesday. Again, it kind of proves, and look, this is not a great situation. We know what happened in Louisiana and Mississippi, but Americans coming together. That's what this country was founded on. It's neighbors helping out neighbors. Absolutely. Back to you in Chicago. Absolutely. And that help very much appreciated. All right, Aaron, thank yeah. you. Well, as we know, the devastation from Ida not just limited to Louisiana. That storm also causing damage inland in Alabama. That's where the National Weather Service confirms a tornado touched down this afternoon. News Nation's Gabby Easterwood from our Mobile, Alabama station, WKRG, live tonight in Sarah Land. So, Gabby, tell us what it's like out there right now. Well, Nicole, the damage here from this tornado is really stretched about a mile or two along Highway 43. And in this trailer park, you can see the damage is just very devastating. It's really like this tornado just ripped through this entire area. You can see some trees back in that area were just snapped in half. Some of the people in this trailer park actually rode out this tornado. We spoke to a man that was in that silver trailer that you just saw on your screen that rode out the tornado. He was inside. He said he stayed inside to protect his cats. He said that he has never experienced anything like this before and that it actually sounded like a freight train coming through and it only lasted a few seconds. But again, this is not the only damage we're seeing at this trailer park. Here is some video that we actually um, got just a little bit earlier here in Sarah Land as well. There are two different motels that have significant damage, mostly to the roofs of the motels both of them having them absolutely ripped off. One of those motels had um, significant damage to the front of their uh, motel. The awning in the front just had significant damage, actually pushed down on a car and landed on a car. And in these motels, people actually live here. So a lot of these people rode out this tornado again, only lasting a few seconds, but having just scared these people to death. They said they just feel extremely um, happy and, and lucky to be alive. But thankfully, here in Sarah Land, there were only three reported injuries, and all three were minor. And as you can see behind me, power crews with Alabama Power and other power utility crews are already out here working to restore the power. Live in Sarah, Sarah Land, Alabama, I'm Gabby Eastwood. Yeah, glad there are only minor injuries there, Gabby. Thank you for that. Let's well, so come tonight on Rush Hour. Our coverage of the extensive devastation caused by Hurricane Ida continues. We are live in New Orleans on the ground with a look at the damage. And evacuations now ordered for a popular California resort city as the Calder fire approaches. News Nation live from South Lake Tahoe next.
We're breaking right now a dangerous situation developing in South Lake Tahoe. We're going to get back to that in just a moment. Right now, we're going to get live to Chief Meteorologist Albert Ramon. He is in our weather center for us. Albert, I know you have an update tonight for us on Ida. Right, so we were talking Ida, we're keeping an eye on that, but also what you're talking about, the fire situation out west. So we have not only eastern portion of the country dealing with the flood threat, but the fire threat uh, out west, in particular in northern California. We know that there are evacuation uh, orders starting to roll out for the South Lake Tahoe area. This is where we need the rain. It's parts of the east where they don't want any rain. This is where we need it. This is a look at the visible satellite. Here are the two fires. We have Dixie Fire. We've been talking about that one for weeks now. And this is the Caldor Fire, now at 177,000 acres, only 14% contained. Invisible satellite showing the smoke associated with both these fires spreading off to the east with winds coming in out of the west. This part of California under a red flag warning. Those are posted when we have high fire danger, and those warnings are posted through at least Wednesday night. It's this part of California where we could have wind gusts between now and Wednesday night, 40, potentially as high as 50 miles per hour, coming in out of the west. So again, critical weather conditions due to fire danger over the next 48 hours. Firefighter is going to be keeping an eye on both of these very closely, especially the Calder fire. That right there, that's Lake Tahoe, and the fire is expanding off towards the northeast. Keep an eye on this one all week long, Nicole. All right, Albert, thank you. The well, News Nation's continuing coverage of Hurricane Ida's aftermath continues. A closer look at the conditions on the ground in Mississippi and Alabama after the storm swept through Louisiana. We're breaking right now a dangerous situation developing in South Lake Tahoe, where fire officials have issued evacuation orders as the Calder Fire inches closer to the resort region, now covering nearly 180,000 acres. Look at this video prompting an area hospital to evacuate patients. Right now, roadways are backed up. They've been th that way all day. As we give you a live look right now, this is Highway 50. News Nation's Melanie Townsend from our station KTXL joining us live. So. Melanie, how many people are impacted by this? Oh, I mean, thousands of people are currently evacuating from South Lake Tahoe as of right now. Right now, it's actually pretty clear. Some cars have kind of passed by. Earlier today, I mean, it was bumper to bumper. People were moving for a good 40 minutes. And another bad thing that was happening was people were cutting in front of each other in this long line. And so that was also creating sort of a backup. But the CAL FIRE officials here have been fantastic in getting everybody squared away and evacuated as safely as possible. They stress that people need to practice patience when it comes to evacuations such as this. I mean, this is a large evacuation that is happening. Of course, tensions are high. People are a little bit afraid of what is going on, but they're doing the best that they can. And as you can see, the roadways are pretty clear as of right now. Further on down, it might be a little bit more backed up, but right now, people are getting evacuated as safely as possible. Another thing that they wanted to point out was that people shouldn't wait just because there isn't much smoke that is happening here, just because you can't see any flames as of right now, doesn't mean that you shouldn't be evacuating. And people uh, are saying that they already had some of their belongings already packed and ready to go. Being Californians, that's what you're supposed to do in wildfire season such as this. And the Caldor fire keeps expanding. Earlier today, we were at a ski resort that was bare Barely, barely scathed by this uh, large, intense fire. A building did burn down over there, but the rest of the ski resort managed to come out unscathed. Uh, of course, we're still monitoring the situation and we're monitoring the evacuations as they unfold. But for right now, we'll toss it back to you. Live here at South Lake Tahoe, Melanie Townsend, back to you. All right, Melanie, thank you for that. Yeah, hopefully everyone will stay safe there. Let's get you back to our storm coverage now, and we're going to take a step back from where Ida is right now. Let's give you a little perspective on the past 24 hours. Here's just one moment from our live breaking coverage last night. Here, just to our south, and several transformers have been blowing as well. That is Blake Brown from our station, WKRG. He was just outside Biloxi, Mississippi, when that explosion 
sparked during his live shot. Now, Ida left streets and homes flooded, buildings destroyed throughout southern Louisiana. The effects, of course, will be felt for a long time in some areas. News Nation had people on the ground spread across the Gulf Coast, bringing you the latest information as it happened. And correspondent Marky Martin was in New Orleans as the then Category 4 hurricane hit, made landfall. Marky, talk to us about your experience last night. Yeah. Hey, Nicole, I think we have some video to show you, too, just of some of our la uh, live hits last night. These wind gusts, I, unlike anything I have ever felt in my entire life, you know, it made landfall as a category four. And those sustained winds were, were very strong. But the gusts that you feel, especially us standing on Canal Street, which really acted like a funnel, right, hitting us at 100 miles per hour, um, it just it stings your face. You could hardly keep your eyes open to even see if there was debris. Uh, had a gear way all of the the bus stops in the middle of the median that glass started to explode under the weight of that wind and all of that pressure so not only do you have debris and palm trees flying around plywood but you had all this invisible glass as well and it's like somebody turned a switch on and those hurricane uh, wind forces just came barreling at us on Canal Street damage there uh, already yesterday afternoon about two o'clock before things even got bad right roofs were ripped off of businesses along the French Quarter. Uh, bar signs started to get blown away and you could feel the collective anxiety and concern from people uh, from people in that area, especially yesterday was the 16th. 16th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. So it brought back a lot of um, traumatic memories. It brought back a lot of fear um, for locals in that area who did decide to hunker down and stay there. But um, it was frightening, Nicole, to say the least. Well, Mark, yeah, you know, I think a lot of us, we, we watch the video, we see the, the reporters, the correspondents out there in the middle of it. And the big question is, you know, how are you staying safe? How are you making sure that you and the rest of your crew weren't hurt? Well, Nicole, thankfully, our crew was set up at a hotel right there on Canal Street. So my live shots that you're watching there were outside for some of them underneath a port cachet that was very sturdy for some of the others after we deemed it unsafe to be outside in the elements. Um, but I'll tell you what, you know, uh, uh, New Orleans has completely lost power. And so as journalists, we're taught not to talk about ourselves. But I will say what I'm experiencing here is what every Louisiana is experiencing right now. You know, we haven't had power. Uh, it's 85 degrees here today. So think about people's homes. You know, my hotel room is probably about 80 degrees right now. People have filled up their tub for emergency drinking water to bathe, to flush their toilets with. People haven't had a hot meal. Our, our crew's last hot meal was yesterday uh, about 1130. And think about the millions of people who are impacted by this. Um, and, and really, there's a mix of mentality. Some people, so many people, I'm so impressed by the resiliency here. Uh, Louisianans are tough. They've been through terrible storms before. They said, you know what? We will rebuild. We're resilient. We've got this. We've got each other's backs. And to watch everybody just come together, band together, bring each other hot coffee and food. I mean, you've never seen anything like it. But um, yeah, our crew is safe. We're, we're, we're good today. And the weather is, is uh, cooperating. Well, Mark, of course, we are glad you are safe. Thank you so much for that excellent reporting. We appreciate it. Live from our News Nation headquarters in Chicago, here's a look at what's happening in your nation right now. The U.S. no longer on the European Union's safe travel list as COVID cases rise across the country. The EU recommending all 27 member countries close their borders to non-essential travel from the United States. But each country decides its own border policies. Before the pandemic, more than 15 million Americans visited Europe each year. The Education Department today announced it's investigating five Republican-led states that have banned mask requirements in schools, saying the policies could amount to discrimination against students with disabilities or health conditions. The department sent letters to education chiefs in Iowa, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Utah. And today, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis says he will appeal a judge's ruling in favor of a group of parents who challenged his ban against school mask mandates. Molly Tibbetts' murderer sentenced today to life in prison without parole. Christian Bahana Rivera showed no emotion as the judge read that sentence. His attorneys declined to speak. Tibbetts was last seen alive in 2018 when she left her Iowa home for a run and never returned. A previous request for a new trial was denied. 
A Georgia district attorney wants the death penalty for Robert Aaron Long. He's the man accused of killing eight people at Atlanta area massage parlors. He's already pleaded guilty to four of the killings and will spend the rest of his life behind bars, but he faces additional charges in the deaths of four other victims. And a 15-year-old facing several charges, including attempted first-degree murder after a shooting at a North Carolina high school. Police say the injured student was hospitalized but is expected to recover. Authorities say the suspected shooter could be charged as an adult. And Chicago's police oversight board recommending an officer be relieved of his duties or placed on administrative leave while he's investigated. For this, video circulated on social media after that officer restrained a woman walking her dog in a park after hours. Now, her attorneys say it was racial profiling, saying four white women were walking behind her. Nikita Brown is black. She's heard asking the unmasked officer to keep a distance of six feet before that officer attempts to restrain her. Mayor Lori Lightfoot says she is disturbed by the video. That is all. And... Let's get to this one here. This is the latest on R. Kelly's trial. After several days of testimony from women claiming they were groomed and sexually abused by singer R. Kelly, a man took the witness stand today to say the R&B star sexually exploited him in the same way when he was a high school student. Now, the 54-year-old Kelly has repeatedly denied accusations that he preyed on victims during his 30-year career. That is all tonight for Rush Hour. You can follow me on social media. Just search Nicole Burley on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The Donlin Report is next. Please have a great Monday night.